Behind every bit of mom wisdom is a story. A story of a real mom and real kids just trying to love each other well. Whether you're cozied up on the couch with a mug of coffee or out for a walk, you're welcome to join us as we share stories and laugh, learn, and grow together. It's the I'm Mom Podcast. Welcome to this week's episode of the I'm Mom Podcast. I'm Abby with Chloe and Megan and Susan once again. And this week we are talking about parenting Generation Alpha. Generation Alpha are kids born between 2010 and the end of 2024. So that is my kids, Megan's kids, Chloe's kid, all of us are parenting Generation Alpha. And I shared with you guys this clip of uh, from ABC about Generation Alpha and their takeover of the skincare industry. It's also like a special on Hulu. And the clip, which I'm going to put in the show notes, it says, tweens have taken to social media to share their makeup and skincare routines, often referred to as get ready with me videos. The videos, these are just crazy because these 11 year old girls look and sound like miniature versions of these 25 year old influencers. They have the same words, the same mannerisms. You can tell they have ring lights. They're like, you know, flashing the tube of drunk elephant um, moisturizer, (laughs) just like one of these like older influencers would. It's just it's crazy. And throughout the segment, they talk about the characteristics of Generation Alpha. And they point out that these kids have more influence in previous generations. And they can persuade their parents to purchase things for them because they have a lot of information. And so since we're all raising Generation Alpha kids, I wanted to talk about what the people who study the culture and its impact say are characteristics of Gen Alpha and see what you guys have to say about it. Any thoughts before we move forward, though, on the get ready videos of 11 year olds. Part of me, I was jealous. I was like, man, I really wish I had started taking care of my skin when I was like 13 (laughs) (laughs) or at least wearing SPF when I was a teenager. Right. Um, Now, well, we had my generation, the big thing was Bath and Body Works and we were like rolling on glitter all over our body and we smelled (laughs) like a headache. Like you just smelled like you had so many scents and flavors on and it was like, but we loved it. I mean, it was just fun. So I, I definitely think that the, makeup skincare thing is always going to be a, a like a fun girl thing because you see your mom do yes, it, you see your yeah. older sisters or whoever it is I definitely think that's always the thing but it, this sounds like it's definitely gotten extreme and I have to wonder like some of those products I've used before that they show in the video and I actually had to stop using them because they're so harsh and mm. I have sensitive skin so I can't imagine like you know a 10 year old who kind of still has baby skin what that could be yeah. doing to their to their skin You know, one thing I'm thinking of the Bath and Body Works thing, you were playing at home with your friends. This is playing for an audience. Wow. It's not not really playing. It's, it's a, you're trying to get attention. Whereas Mm -hmm. when girls played with that kind of stuff at home, they were doing it for their own pleasure. They weren't doing it to entertain other people and get attention. It's very different to me. Well, and that's a sign of the generation. It's, someone's always watching me because since the day they were born, their parents were putting them online. And uh, what does that do to them? Does yeah. that, is that playing then anymore? Yeah. I don't know. Well, so that is my first point. Before we get into the characteristics of Generation Alpha, I want to real quick say what what generations are all of us. I'm a zillennial. I'm an ex-boomer. Like I'm right yeah. on the cusp of exes. I think we're like, we're all in cusps, all in cusps. except yeah. for Megan. Megan, you're, you're a solid millennial. I'm a solid millennial. Nice. Yeah. So Megan, or um, Megan, solid millennial. Susan, you're on the cusp of boomer and ex. I'm on the cusp of ex and millennial. I'm and on, Chloe, you're on the cusp of millennial and Z. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it depends on the study. Yeah. That's so funny because I was looking at studies and, and one of them said, uh, millennial starts at 1977. And I was like, and you know, what world is 1977? Because I'm 1980 and that is X. Yeah. X-ish. Well, that's like the, most of them say 80, 81 is the start okay. of millennials. Huh. And I'm like 77. Wow. But anyway, so a generation of kids is shaped not only by the environment around them, but also by the people who are parenting them. So how do you think that millennials and older Gen Zers are influencing Generation Alpha. Because like I said, I'm I'm X slash millennial and my kids are like the oldest. So I think most of the people who are parenting Generation yeah. Alpha are millennials. I have a question for you, Megan, because this is something that I'm starting to get bothered by is when James does see my phone, he like looks at it like he, you know, it's the colors and stuff, but it really kind of makes me panic because I'm so aware of like how addictive our screens are. And like, not that I'm not going to let him have screen time, but I'm 
getting really nervous about how to introduce that to him and boundaries to have around it. Yeah. Um, so both my kids can work my phone, which is sad because James is four and a half and Beck is one and a half. Like they know that you touch the screen and things move. James, obviously, since he's four and a half, could operate it a lot better than Beck it could, but they, I do not let them have pads yet. Um, and like the only screen time they have is watching a movie mm-hmm. or a show. It's still more than I w- I would like, but um, it does scare me. Like, I mean, we have a Google home and we say, hey, Google play, you know, whatever. And mm-hmm. James can easily work that. <laughs> so he knows exactly how to use it. He could probably ask it to do anything and it'll tell him, which is kind of scary. So I'm probably gonna have to put a lock on that now that I think about it um, as he gets older. But um, yeah, I mean, I think for our generation, it's a really scary thing because for me as a millennial, my parents' generation, it, it's just so different. Like yeah. they didn't have to really parent, like my mom never had to really parent me through social media because I didn't have it until yeah. like later in college or early college. Um, I remember Facebook, you had to have a college email to get a Facebook mm-hmm. and like that was, it came out right when I was in college. So I feel like, or I was in high school, but so, um, so I feel like it's scary for me because I go to my mom and my parents for a lot of parenting advice. And this is going to be one arena that I'm not going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, you can ask your friends certain things, but I feel like friends have such strong, different opinions. Well, And they're in this together with you. They don't know any better than you do. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And that's my kind of my point is to me, it's really it's really scary to navigate the Internet and social media because I don't feel like I have a really, really good trusted source that I can go to on like how to handle these things. And there's so many different platforms of, you know, locking your kids stuff and spyware and whatever. And I'm like, I don't know which one is good. (laughs) I've never had to use this. I don't I don't. I don't know. Abby's writing about it. Oh, yeah. I've written about it. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Sure, sure. So here are some things to know about Generation Alpha. First one is that they are the first entire generation to exist alongside social media and smartphones. And many of them have a digital presence since birth. They're also called the iPad kids. Oh. And the, in fact, the oldest in this generation were born the year that the iPad debuted. So this is kind of like a, a big thing with this generation. And we've kind of already talked about it quite a bit as just technology, privacy, anonymity. And it'll be part of their curriculum in school. They'll probably have iPads Mm -hmm. starting in first grade or kindergarten. Uh, I don't know. Yes. Yes. I mean, my son is born in 2011. And so, and yes, his whole, whole time in school, he has had some technology in front of him and it drives me crazy because it feels like it is count it's pushing back on the things that I'm trying to do which is less screen time I want their eyes to rest for a little bit and and school is making that very difficult so how do you think having a digital presence is going to affect them in the long term and the thing that I want to kind of talk about is will they feel okay being ordinary when so much of having a digital presence is getting likes or standing out or whatever how will that affect them mentally to to not be an influencer? You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, I think that's why we've seen suicide and depression rates go up. And there's a really good Netflix documentary. Chloe, do you remember the name of it? It was it was all about this. It was all about the rise in depression and suicide due to social media. Was it the social but experiment? It was on Netflix. Was it Maybe social it was that. It came out. It came out like what four yeah. years? Four years ago? Mm-hmm. Five years ago? Um, maybe not even that long, but. It's, I would encourage everyone to watch it because I think it's just, it's a good, and they were interviewing CEOs and COOs of all yep. the major platforms. Yeah. And they were saying they don't let their kids have them, right? Yeah. They're, yeah. yeah their execs do not let their kids have their tool. <laughs> right. It's crazy. I do think before the depression and suicide comes this loneliness. And I think that's the one thing we've seen in a lot of the studies is this trend upward of people saying that they're lonely. Mm. And I remember one time when one of my boys was in school, he was kind of, even though he was in a fraternity and all this other stuff, he said, well, you know, I was walking across this, the campus and I saw this girl that I had in a class and um, uh, and she was looking at me and he goes, so I looked down at my phone and then he said, gosh, she's kind of cute. I should probably like try to, as I'm walking by, talk to her. And he said, and I looked up and she was looking at me and then she looked down. And so you see this kind of 
people being uncomfortable with eye contact yes. and actually having to communicate face to face versus texting someone or DMing them. Yeah. Yeah. Cause our, our phones are an escape, whether Correct. we want to escape boredom or, yep. you know, we're standing in line waiting for the airplane and we don't want to sit there and have to talk to somebody or look at somebody and yeah. we're not used to being uncomfortable. Or we put or our headphones bored. in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another characteristic of Generation Alpha is that they will be more financially aware. That doesn't mean they'll be savvy, <laughs> but they'll be aware. So back when I was a kid, a commercial would come on TV and I would shout to my mom, mom, will you get me the blah, blah, blah for my birthday or for Christmas, whatever's coming up next. Now my kids can be playing Roblox and ask me for ten dollars to buy robux and like so they just have more opportunities to spend because it's all right there in front of them i actually think they might be less financially savvy because they buy things because these platforms on our uh, they're on are linked to their parents' credit card and they just buy stuff. Yeah. Like I I had, um, oh, I remember it was a guy from our office told us that he spent a bunch of money in a gaming thing because he didn't really realize he was doing oh, it. It was like $2,000 yes, and he it had was. to have it. it yeah, was. He went and disputed it. Was. It. it was yes. oh, a big deal. Yes. So, you know, they really don't understand that the money just goes. I see that, you know, with Amazon, I think nothing of, I'll just go buy yeah. this. Whereas before I would have had to go to the store and yeah. actually find it in a store. Yeah. And you learn to live without. Now you don't have to learn. You yeah. don't have to live without. Well, Leanna, one of the ladies in the office, told a story that when she was growing up, she raised hogs and <laughs> she would raise a hog, sell the hog, and then use that money to buy, her parents made her use it to buy everything. And she was bitter about it because she's like, she used it to like buy her school clothes that she <laughs> wanted to wear. Yeah. But she understood working for money, yeah. budgeting, spending the money. And she's like, I don't know if I'll be that extreme with my kids, but how do we set our kids up for success? This generation that can spend m money on something that you can't actually hold mm -hmm. and money that you can't actually hold. Like how do we set them up for success to understand the power of money? Especially because, especially where in this case you've brought up, these girls are spending so much money on face care products mm. that A, they don't need at their age and and B, yeah, drunken elephants, not cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of that is cheap. Mm -hmm. It's way more expensive than Bath and Body Works. I yeah. can tell you that. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, doing things like working on a budget with them, giving them actual cash or those debit card programs, maybe even doing like the financial piece, junior or whatever it is, you mm -hmm. know, anything that is proactive. You know, I think that we forget that we do have control over what they do and where they spend their money. They are still children. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not totally helpless in it. Okay. If it, at 12 or 13, you're using expensive brand facial products, are you getting Botox by 18? Well, yeah, that's... I mean, what is you don't next Because you've been taking that. care of your skin the hey. whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another generation alpha characteristic is that they're adaptive and capable. So they have had to, or they have been able to watch technology change mm. quite a bit. My kids can help my mom transfer photos to the cloud. They can set up her new laptop. Mm -hmm. I, I handed my 12 year old my phone the other day and I said, I can't find old episodes of this reflection thing I'm listening to. Can you please figure out how to do it? 30 seconds later, he's like, here you go. Mm. I think that this is great for their self-esteem. I think that they feel capable mm -hmm. because of the way that they're able to navigate technology. But the question is, what happens when your kids know more about the device than you do? And all of a sudden they're like, you don't... I know your phone better than you do. You can't tell me how to be safe. Yeah, I, d I definitely think we've been talking about this for a long time on iMom. You have to embrace mm. digital, that your kids may be digital natives and you are not. And so you will have to work harder to stay ahead of them, but it's something you should do for this world anyway, because if you get to like 70 and 80, you're going to be out. Like you're mm. not going to be able to manage your own finances because you're not going to be, you're not going to know how to access them. And I definitely see that like with my parents' age. They, everything has gone online. Even their doctor's appointments, their yeah. medical records are online. They can't even get into their account. Who knows how it's going to be, you know, 30, 40 years from now. Yeah. So technology is here to stay. It's only going to get better. The kids are going to be better at it than you are. So you're going to have to work harder. Yeah. How do you convince them that you know better, even if you don't know more? Oh, you got to dig in with them. Yeah. 
you, you, you have to say, okay, I see that you, you know how to work this. That's great. What is that doing to you? What is it doing to your friends? What's the motive in your heart and using it? There's still all the same principles behind it because mm -hmm. anything in this world can be used for good yeah. or evil. Yeah. <laughs> so no matter what technology, like let's say it's right now, it's, you know, AI, generative AI. We've all been using AI for years, right. but generative AI is coming alongside. Gosh, it, I love it. It's helping me with so many things. I actually have co-pilot. Thank you, Mary Jo, one of our writers who introduced me to that last week. Um, Gemini and ChatGPT all open all the time on my thing. I put stuff into them all the time. Mm -hmm. So use it. Something yeah. new comes on, use it, adapt to it, pick what you like, learn the good and bad of it. And you got to teach the good and bad to your children, just like anything else you, you have in life. Another characteristic of Generation Alpha is they don't have the same respect and careful with that word, the same respect for hierarchies or traditional power. And so let me explain this. It's not that they don't respect authority. It's that they have a different experience with how power can be exercised. One person on Twitter can be heard now by as many people as you know, 30 years ago, the president giving an address on television. Kids in Generation Alpha know that anyone has the power to get his or her voice heard. I think that this is creating in them this urge and this desire to be YouTube famous influencers. I, I think that this is one of those things where they realize that they can affect the pe people around them. How do we make sure that what they're saying is worth saying. Words are important. They can be used for good and evil. Yeah. It's the same thing. And so if you're not monitoring, so this is going to show how old I am and my kids, but when email came out at school, our kids got access to email. One of my children was kind of, you know, writing some emails that could have been phrased better or, you know, and, and I had to say, look, you're, this sounds right to you, but you don't have the filter right now to understand that you're being offensive. So you can't send emails anymore without me looking at them. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk about why you're saying is, is not correct. If you give your child access to social media and you don't monitor and coach them on what they're saying and why and understanding the motive of their heart and why they say it, then you're probably creating a monster. Or allowing a monster because that really social child is going to say whatever it takes to get the likes or to get the attention. And that could really hurt her or him in the future. Or hurt other people in the present. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Just because you have the power to be heard doesn't mean it needs to be said. <laughs> yeah. So why are we doing this? Why, you know, is this really healthy for children? I don't think so. Yeah. Our, you know, we, we teach our kids manners because we're teaching them to be considerate. If we're allowing them to go on social media without any filtering or coaching or teaching, that can be really detrimental to them and other people. You know how now they say uh, that colleges are looking at kids' social media feeds and whatever. Do you think that in 20 years when everybody has this past where they have said something stupid online, do you think that we're going to care as much? Do you think it's going to hold as much weight? Because everyone's going to have dirt. Everyone's going to have that, you know, that time they went online and said that thing. No, it goes to moral character. I, I look at every single employee's when I interview them, I look at their social. I mean, I've been doing HR work now for over 10 years. And as when I'm looking at hiring someone, that's the first place I go. I don't even go to their LinkedIn. I go to their social media first. Yeah, but in, in, in the Megan in 25 years from now, who is looking at all of these generation alpha people, they're all going to have always been online and always saying stupid stuff online. Or can you even weed them out at that point? No, because the introverts really aren't doing this. A lot of introverts really don't, but you are going to learn their moral character. And if they learned their lesson, they're going to delete when they didn't like, yeah. they're mm -hmm. going to say, that was the dumb me. This yeah. is the smart me. I'm a new person. I've grown up and I'm going to delete that. So I think you know, yes, people learn about people by what they post and, you know, what they're proud of. And if you're proud of putting out trash, well, people are going to see that. Yeah. All right. One last characteristic of Generation Alpha. And I think this one is a really big one for me. Their parents, so us, are more aware of mental health and that is good and bad. Mm. So it, for the most part, it's good. But 
you know, I can notice. So now I'm equipped to notice signs of depression or anxiety in my kids. But on the other hand, am I overcompensating to protect my child from anxiety? Am mm-hmm. I keeping him from experiencing things in life that is going to, you know, prepare him for the path? Yeah. Or Mary Jo, our, one of our writers, was saying that she, her husband stopped her one day. He's like, you're talking to our son like you're a, an amateur therapist. <laughs> like we know just enough based, you know, because of what we do, we know just enough to sound like we know what we're talking about. And he's like, talk to our kid like you're his mom. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. You know, there's all these Instagram accounts that teach us, like I said, just enough to be kind of helpful and kind of dangerous that we forget that God has already given us what we need to love our kids and to sit with them and to feel for them and to guide them. Yeah, it's good. I will say I'd love to see our parents today uh, teach their kids a little bit more grit. Yeah. I do feel like we're bubble wrapping and catering them to them. And that goes back to the mental thing. Like, is this a really a serious problem or is my child just being whiny and needs to pull it together? Well, and that actually came up in conversation. How do you know when you're planting a seed, when you talk to your kids, you know, like, so they've heard about depression in school Mm -hmm. and then, or you talk to them about depression, which is good. I mean, yes, these are good conversations to have, but then because they're children and they don't necessarily know the implications of what they're saying, they say, mom, I'm depressed or whatever. Like what's the line between hearing it and, and listen and listening to them, but then also pushing them to go to school today or yeah, whatever. It yeah. Is. We're in a bad season. And yes. Yeah, so I can see why it's, it, it's a depressing season for mm-hmm. you. Right. Um, but we have to, yeah, redirect them. We have to make the most of every day. Yeah. God gave you this day. So let's see if we can just challenge yourself to, find the good in it. You know, we have to redirect them to positive because you don't want the child to start living in this while well, I'm in this yeah. down world. Yeah. yeah. No. Right. And that's where I think it's a little bit, it's just hard to know what we know about mental health, but not necessarily know how to coach our kids through it. Like mm-hmm. what is the right response that is not exacerbating it, not, but, but also, you know, loving them through it. I was talking to them my grandmother about this. Cause I remember when I was little, my grandmother would tell me stories about how when she was little, she shared a room and they would have the bomb raids and they'd have to turn on all the lights and be really quiet and still. Cause they were in the middle of world war two. And, you know, they were also then in a depression, you know, I mean, they like had nothing, had nothing. And so it's interesting. Cause she literally never complains about anything <laughs> now. Like she broke her hip and didn't call anyone until the next morning because she didn't want to get up off the floor and wake anyone up oh, in the middle of the night. Oh my like, God. Just <laughs> insane stuff like that, that I just wonder if, because we haven't, our generation hasn't really, I mean, yes, we had COVID, which was absolutely horrific and terrible for everyone, but like, we haven't had to like live through a war or anything, you know, that's r- really made us have to be thankful for, or thankful for what we have or whatever it might be. Like our biggest struggle is, you know, who's doing what on social media that we haven't learned how to really be thankful for what we do have and that we're not in the middle of World War III right now. And I just, I think of all the people like in the Ukraine and, you know, Israel, Gaza, all those places that are like living through these horrendous things. And like our biggest concern is how many likes we're getting on social media. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a weird parallel universe. And we have money to spend on drunken elephant at the age of 12. Yeah. Which is kind of what I was saying about we are, the the generation is influenced by the people who are raising them. So the millennials and the, the old Gen Zers that are raising them you know, my parents didn't have technology, so I didn't grow up with technology. My parents were not keen on therapy. Nobody went to therapy back then. And so I didn't know how to talk about my feelings. So like, as we are raising these kids and watching this generation, we also have to look back at what we were raised on and who we were raised by and go, all right, let's take the good things that they did. Let's think about how we can push our kids to have a little bit more grit, to keep walking when they break their hip or whatever. You know? <laughs> Not that bad. Like, Not what that is, <laughs> but like, what's the, what's the real life implication for that with our kids? I think you, you got to take the best from the previous generation and take the mm-hmm. best from what you have now. And, um, you know, and just pray. Yeah. I think <laughs> the, what the greatest thing we ever did with our kids in that respect is we did make them go to other countries on mission trips. 
I think, you know, if your child lives in a great situation and they're not really seeing reality, it's more, you know, it's a, it's a cultural problem here. We have too much, some of us, uh, sending them for a while into an environment to just get a different perspective is so educational. Yeah. Just remember, God made you a parent right now. I really believe that of this generation as who exactly who you are. So have confidence in that. And thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the iMom podcast. iMom is the motherhood program of the nonprofit organization Family First. Along with our fatherhood program, All Pro Dad, we exist to help you love your family well. Subscribe to our daily email, the iMom Minute, by going to imom.com slash subscribe and get tons of great ideas, insight, and inspiration. The iMom podcast is hosted by me, Abby Watts, along with Susan Merrill, Megan Tigner, and Chloe Blumenthal. As we wrap up today, I want to share something that's important to us here at iMom. We believe that every child deserves to know the love of a mom and a dad. We hope you believe the same thing and might even be willing to take an extra step to change a child's life. Around the country, but especially in the state of Florida where iMom is based, there's a pressing need for medical foster care parents. These foster parents provide crucial support to children with complex medical needs. To be a medical foster care parent, you don't need a medical background. We've partnered with local community-based care agencies and the Florida Department of Children and Families who provide comprehensive training. If you can offer the vital medical assistance these children need, along with compassionate care in a family environment, you're prepared to be a true medical foster care champion. Learn more by visiting mfcfloridahealth.gov. That's mfc.floridahealth.gov.